So brace yourself because it's going to be a little jarring the first sound that I get to. Whether you know it or not, you've definitely heard that sample at some point in your lifetime. It's one of the most influential and widely used samples in musical history. We actually hear sampling on a daily basis, and it's given us some of the most intriguing musical creations of the past 20 years or so. However, because sampling directly involves reusing another artist's work, it's created a lot of controversy and it's faced a lot of criticism. And I think that's really unfortunate, because sampling is a beautifully transformative and wonderfully creative art form. And if you need any evidence of this, you just have to do a little looking. One of my favorite consequences of digital sampling is the idea that multiple artists can look at the same original source material, the same original sample, and each of them will turn it into something entirely new and unique. And a great instance of this comes from the 1970 piano recording by Ahmad Jamal. It's called I Love Music. It's a very jazzy, dynamic, expressive piece. And dozens of producers have heard this song, and each of them have turned it into entirely new compositions. And I have two of my favorite examples here for you. The first one is called Keep Pushing by Blue, and it sounds like this. I scribbled all out of line when I drew up a self-portrait, ran all out of space and found me in another orbit, more importantly. So Keep Pushing is produced by Knowledge, and Knowledge is a producer who's gaining a lot of traction for his very offbeat, unorthodox production style. And you can really hear how he bends the pitch of the sample, how he creates this weird kind of dissonance. And it's very beautiful. Uh, and it's a total subversion of the original sample. The next song is a hip hop classic. It's called The World Is Yours by Nas. It's yours. The world is this? The world is yours. The world is yours. Smile, smile, smile. Whose world is this? So that's produced by Pete Rock, who's a seminal hip hop producer. He's inspired many a musician since. And his approach on the sample is a little more grounded, a little more traditional, which isn't to say it's any less creative. It's just less out there, and it's a little more true to the original form of the sample, which actually lends itself to Nas's particular brand of rap music, as it happens. Uh, because Nas is an artist that tends to be profound and upfront, so the authenticity of Pete Rock's sample job supports the authenticity of Nas's message. So you can sort of see already how musicians are taking different approaches to their sampling techniques if they want to end up with different results. Another dimension in which we can examine the transformative power of sampling is if we want to see how someone can change the mood of a song via the process of sampling. And that takes us to the good old 50s with Doris Day's Que Sera Sera, which was later remixed and uh, sampled by a European producer named Wax Taylor. So we'll first listen to the Doris Day song. <laughs> When I was just a little girl, I asked my mother, what will I be? So Doris Day's voice just immediately emanates and evokes a sense of joy, and you just want to smile listening to her. There's just this bright, lovely instrumentation that's buoying her singing. And it's really interesting how Wax Taylor subverts this. Let's listen to his take. A record of the delightful piece they're going to play. Let me tell you. That's the same Doris Day that we were just listening to. But now she's so sad. She's so forlorn. And it's all because of this musical atmosphere that Wax Taylor creates. This sparse, minimal, moody, just strange environment backed by these sparse guitars. And what's really cool is how the message of the song kind of changes. Because when I hear Doris Day's version, Que Sera Sera, I think, don't dwell on the stressful things and just live your life. But whenever I listen to Wax Taylor's Que Sera, what comes to my mind is whatever's happening is happening with or without you, and you can't do anything about it. And he turns Doris Day's optimism into his own brand of nihilism. And the musical atmosphere makes all of the difference. If we want to look at how sampling can change the meaning of a song, though, or how samples can be used meaningfully, especially, I don't think there's any way we can avoid Jay Dilla's donuts. So Jay Dilla is uh, one of the greatest musicians of our time. I think one of my favorite musicians in history. Uh, and in 2006, he made this album, Donuts. Uh, and he died three days afterwards, succumbing to a blood disease. Uh, and while he was in the hospital, he made this album. 
And you can sort of tell he knows he's on his deathbed. Every single song on Donuts takes some older song, usually from the 60s, and it turns it into a part of his life story. And he relays all these old bygone clips and samples into some message that he wants to convey to the audience. And I'd love to talk about every single song on this album because every single one is so beautifully unique and so beautifully individual and amazing in its own way. But the best one, in my opinion, speaks for itself. It's called Welcome to the Show. It's the closing track on the album, and it samples a Canadian rock band named Motherload in their song When I Die. So this is what When I Die sounds like. <laughs> Now let's listen to Jay Dill's Welcome to the Show. Welcome to Ace Rodney. Big talk for the superstars. Tonight, tonight, we have a guest, the incredible, incredible, incredible. So Jay Dill takes the harmony at the end of that sample and he loops it, and that becomes Welcome to the Show. And that may seem like a very simple technique but there's so much more at play here because now there's so much more expression and so much more emotion in the sample. And everything now becomes tied to Jay Dilla's evaluation and his deathbed and as he considers, is he the man who he wanted to be? And has he made all the right choices in his life? And it's a beautiful, profound statement that closes a beautiful, profound album. And I encourage you all to listen to Donuts if you have any inclination towards sampling or this whole kind of artistic pursuit. So Jay Dilla uses sampling as a means of conveying himself as an individual. But sampling can also be used to convey the values of a society as a greater whole. And that takes us to Kanye West with the Gold Digger. So Gold Digger samples I've Got a Woman by Ray Charles, which I'll play a little bit of for you. Well, I got a woman way over town that's good to me. So if you actually listen to I've Got a Woman, and it's a great song, but if you listen to the lyrics, it's actually kind of sexist because the lyrics are all about how the ideal woman should know her place and how that place is often in the home. And when Kanye West is using that idea, that sample, and he's talking about monetary gain in relationships and those superficial kind of relationships, the titular gold digger, it's an important juxtaposition. And it's one we have to pay attention to if we want to understand the full power and impact of this song. And the question that comes to my mind is, how do we treat gold diggers in our society? If you look at the narrative of the song, Gold Digger, the first two verses are about the titular gold digger, a woman who gets into a relationship for, with a man for the sake of financial wealth. But the third verse is one that not a lot of people really talk about, but it's the most important one. It's about a woman who sticks by her man faithfully through all of his financial woes, and then once he strikes it rich, he immediately leaves her for a younger woman. And I think Kanye West is shining a spotlight on the fact that the gold digger scenario, it cuts both ways, but we only really criticize one side of it in our society. We have a tendency to only talk about the people who are the gold diggers, who seek financial gain, but there's still rich people on the other end perpetuating that relationship. And why aren't they getting criticized? Does it go back to our idea of gender roles and our idea of what a woman is supposed to be? This antiquated idea that maybe we think we've grown out of, but Kanye West is pointing out is still very real. I don't know if Kanye West necessarily intended to have this discussion, but it's one that opens up with or without his intent, and it's one that exists only because of the use of the sample. And that's really a power that sampling brings. And as much as I'd love to talk about my favorite samples for days and weeks on end, I think there's another discussion we need to have whenever we talk about sampling, and that involves property rights. So sampling and copyrights have a very complicated relationship, as you've probably heard about through various news stories. Uh, and it goes deeper than you might think because copyright law doesn't really have a firm stance when it comes to sampling. And that's because copyright law was drafted in regards to written infringement. 
And you can look at two paragraphs and pretty easily tell if one of them had to infringe from the other. But with sampling, it's so much harder. And with music in general, it's so much harder because there are all these artistic notions and subjective ideas that come into play. And it's really hard to quantify in a court of law. But I think it's something we need to figure out. And the reason I say that is because of Gregory S. Coleman on the right here. Uh, he was in a band with Richard L. Spencer, and that band was called The Winstons. And The Winstons were kind of a one-hit wonder, and that one hit was called Amen Brother. And Amen Brother's legacy will forever be these 10 seconds, maybe less, where Gregory S. Coleman gets to play a little drum solo, which sounds like this. <laughs> And that's the same clip I played for you at the beginning of this talk. And whether you know it or not, you've definitely heard that sample at some point in your lifetime. It's everywhere. It's the drum loop in Straight Outta Compton. It's the foundation for a lot of modern techno and electronica music. And I'm 90% sure it was in a Teen Titans video game I played when I was younger. <laughs> it's everywhere. But Gregory S. Coleman never really received compensation for that. Because in 2006, he died homeless and broke on the streets of Atlanta, Georgia. And I think that that's really a modern musical tragedy, that someone so vastly influential and powerful in how he shaped our modern world of music could die in such a sorry state. And that's why I think something needs to change about how we consider and reconcile these notions of sampling. And the first step towards that is respecting and legitimizing sampling as an art form. And bearing that in mind, I'd like to talk about a particular power of sampling that has affected me most personally. And that's its ability to bridge cultures together. It's hard to imagine these vastly different cultural worlds coming together as intimately and as intricately as they do without the mechanism of sampling. And I'm talking about in the early 2000s, when producers turned to the East to try to find sampling material, and they found Indian film music. And that was awesome for me, because now there are all these Indian film songs I've known my entire life, and they're popping up in these hip hop songs, and it's this really interesting cultural collision for me. And one of these songs is Shisha Sharab Shabanam. My grandma's in the audience, and she's probably laughing at how I pronounce that. <laughs> uh, Shisha Sharab Shabanam. And uh, I've known it since I was four years old, uh, and I really know it by heart. I'm going to play a little bit of it here. So that's a very soft, flowy, calm instrumental, which is really interesting because that stands in complete contrast to the song that it's sampled in, which happens to be Ultimate by Denzel Curry. A very jarring, aggressive, on the offense instrumental. That's enough of that. So, <laughs> Ultimate is produced by Ronnie J, a uh, Florida-based producer, and he couldn't have taken a smaller portion of the sample if he really tried. He takes like a few piano notes and he loops it, and that becomes Ultimate. And I've known Shisha Sharab Shabanam my entire life, and believe me, I've heard Ultimate a lot of times before I realized that these songs were so intricately related, and that one of them, in fact, sampled the other. And it just goes to show that the smallest snippet just these few piano notes can form the basis for an entire song because of sampling. Another great hip-hop song that makes use of Indian film music is Auditorium by Mos Def. That's produced by Madlib, who's one of the other greatest hip-hop producers of all time, in my opinion. And that's, this is what it sounds like. Hey. Hey. Peace, 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 peace. Bow. Bow. Uh, 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 uh. Mad liberator. Death operator. Rock the data. Amazing flavor. Yo. And it was the second I heard those strings, those beautiful, rich, full strings, that I knew that this was an Indian film song sample because there's something about Indian film songs and the strings that they use that's so beautifully unique and so uniquely tied and individually to that setting of Indian film music and cinema. 
And I knew I had to find where the sample came from, and I went searching far and wide all over the internet, all these message boards and YouTube comment sections, until I found that it was on this website called whosampled.com the whole time. Uh, and it's from this older Indian song that I'm about to butcher the pronunciation of called Do Jut Jie. Jut Jie Ek Such Ke Liye. And, <laughs> sorry, Nani. And, um, <laughs> And what's really interesting about Dojutjie is that the sample isn't really that significant in the whole, in the whole song, Dojutjie. It's just this little interlude that goes from the refrain to the next verse. But it's everything in auditorium. And that's really what sampling is all about. It's about taking a musical idea that works so well in a given context, pulling it out, and then replacing it into a new context where it works just as well, if not better. And that process of extraction and recontextualization, as I hope I've proven to you today, is a very deliberate and a very intentioned process. And the second we're all able to collectively realize that and respect sampling as a legitimate art form, then we can all sit back and let these innovative musicians do what they do best, which is to keep shaking the foundations and expanding the boundaries of artistic expression as we know it. Thank you.